Having an autoimmune condition can feel like you are on a deserted island all by yourself. Having systemic sclerosis, otherwise known as scleroderma, can feel like that island is on the other side of the planet. Although there is so much autoimmune diet information out there, it's tough to know how much of it is applicable to scleroderma, a condition that seems to behave differently than other autoimmune conditions. This is why I want to get real specific today and talk about the diet changes that will best serve those facing scleroderma or even scleroderma overlap conditions conditions like mixed connective tissue disorder. We are going to talk about the anti-inflammatory diet, eating for esophageal problems, and eating to keep your gut happy. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology. Let's get started. There is no lack of diets, protocols, cookbooks, or guides on the internet when it comes to autoimmune diets. Everything from vegan to plant-based to keto and elimination diets, everyone is happy to sell you something that will reverse or cure your autoimmune condition. The medical literature is actually just as messy as the internet when it comes to this kind of stuff, which is why you can get so many different opinions. The truth is, diet does matter. Of course it matters. How we feed our bodies has an impact on how we feel and how well our systems work. But there is no one size fits all and how we think about the impact any kind of eating style may have on our health is dependent on the medical condition we are facing and the severity of that condition. I say this to set the stage for talking about the anti-inflammatory diet and scleroderma. The anti-inflammatory diet, with the most well-known one being the Mediterranean diet, is the most studied and thus most recommended way of eating when you have an autoimmune condition. It's low in sugar and ultra-processed foods, high in healthy fats, proteins, and veggies, and can calm systemic inflammation that will generally help everyone feel their best. This is through a combination of nutrient-dense foods that provide us with what our systems need to function, as well as healthy microbiome management. I have certainly seen those with autoimmune conditions like Sjogren's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or psoriatic arthritis significantly improve their inflammation and condition by making these kinds of diet changes. But like I said, how we think about the impact we are likely to experience is dependent on the condition we are facing, and scleroderma is a different kind of autoimmune condition from those others. Scleroderma is a condition that's marked more by fibrosis than inflammation. This means that the symptoms we feel, the skin tightening, the difficulty swallowing, or even the lung problems, well, they are a consequence of fibrosis, not active inflammation. This is why our immune system targeted anti-inflammatory medications do little for this condition and why we need to adjust our expectations for what the anti-inflammatory diet can do for us when we have scleroderma. It's not to say that you won't feel better and have more energy if you stick to anti-inflammatory foods, but the likelihood that you can reverse or prevent progression is unfortunately low. This is not to be a downer, but to be real. It's only when we understand our condition and the limitations of these different interventions out there that we can then build a care plan that will work for us. Now, I keep mentioning an anti-inflammatory diet, but what exactly am I talking about? Well, an anti-inflammatory diet is one that is low in pro-inflammatory foods or foods that are known to trigger inflammatory pathways in our body, like sugar, refined carbs, and ultra-processed foods. It's also low in trans fats, hydrogenated oils, and omega-6 fatty acids, all of which can be found in fast food. And an anti-inflammatory diet can also sometimes be low in dairy and gluten, although those are two that are very individualized. Instead, we want to eat anti-inflammatory foods, such as leafy greens, colorful fruits and vegetables, omega-3 rich foods like fish, whole grains, beans, and fermented foods. Those with scleroderma also need to be mindful of how much protein they eat, in that they should make sure they're getting enough. We tend to lose muscle mass with scleroderma as a result of the fibrosis, and although strength training can help fight against this, we need to give our body the building blocks to build muscle, and that comes in the form of protein. There are a million and one anti-inflammatory food cookbooks out there, and I'm gonna to link to my favorite, which is by a friend of mine. But I like to keep it real simple. 
eating less fast food and cook more at home. Limit the food in your pantry that comes in a box or bag and don't beat yourself up if you aren't perfect. Before moving on to how to eat with scleroderma esophagus, I wanna tell you about something I've been working on that I'm super excited about. It's called the Connected Clubhouse, and it's a private community for anyone with an autoimmune condition or currently in the midst of trying to figure out if they have one, who is interested in learning more, not only from experts like me, but from others traveling the same path. In the Clubhouse, you'll get more access to me, to answer your questions via live virtual events, as well as hear what's new in rheumatology and autoimmune care, and you'll hear from other special guests. You know, social media is, Yes, it's social media. I love bringing to YouTube information that is or should be discussed in our rheumatology clinics, but in the clubhouse, I'll get to be even more specific to your situation and questions. I hear from patients all the time about what is happening out there in our clinics, and I know it's rough out there. I know we aren't getting the information and support we need, so the clubhouse will allow me to support you in between your visits as you navigate your healthcare. I'll leave a link in the description box so you can learn more, and I hope to see you in the Connected Clubhouse. The fibrosis of scleroderma can impact many parts of the body, and one of the most common areas is the esophagus. Our esophagus is a muscular tube that connects our mouth to our stomach, and through a controlled rhythmic muscle movement called peristalsis, the esophagus moves food down. Once the food arrives at the stomach, a valve called the lower esophageal sphincter will open up, allowing all the food into the stomach and then close back up again so the stomach acid doesn't go back up into the esophagus. The fibrosis of scleroderma can make it harder for the esophagus muscles to work together, resulting in an inability to smoothly move food down. It also can make that lower valve loose, allowing stomach acid to escape and cause heartburn. These two issues can conspire to make eating less enjoyable, unpleasant, and like downright painful. So focusing on diet changes that can address these realities that are specific to those with scleroderma can do a lot for your quality of life. So first, you want to make sure you're drinking plenty of water with your food. Having a dry mouth with scleroderma can exacerbate the esophagus issues, so drinking water can help food just move down more comfortably. You also want to eat smaller but more frequent meals. Big, dry meals have a tendency to get stuck, making eating very uncomfortable. We also need to be mindful of your stomach acid. Aside from discomfort, having stomach acid in your esophagus can put you at risk for a host of other problems that we'd like to avoid if at all possible. So stay away from spicy foods or foods high in acid like citrus fruits. Most of the time I don't need to tell my patients this as they have learned the hard way and know which foods to avoid. Other good habits to build when you have heartburn with scleroderma can be sleeping with the head of the bed elevated and not eating for a few hours before going to bed. Scleroderma's effect on the GI system doesn't stop at the stomach, however. Our lower gut and intestines can also be impacted, leading to bloating, decreased nutrient absorption, and constipation. It is common to have an altered microbiome and focusing on probiotic foods and supplements can help keep that microbiome balanced. Supplements can be helpful, but if possible, get your probiotics from probiotic rich foods like yogurt or other fermented foods. We wanna make sure that our foods are nutrient dense given the difficulties many have with absorption. One very specific way of eating that may be worth investigating is the low FODMAP diet. FODMAP stands for fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, all of which are just different kinds of carbs. This is a diet many with IBS or IBD may be familiar with as it can ease bloating. A full low FODMAP diet can be restrictive and isn't meant to be followed forever, but it's more of a guide to experiment with and find if there are particular foods that impact you more than others. Because of the need to maintain high protein and nutrient dense foods, I will always recommend experimenting with these diet changes alongside a registered dietitian. Changing the way we eat can take time and keen observation and is wrapped up in cultural and societal norms and prejudices that we may not even think about when we start out. 
Having an objective partner with you as you start this journey is always a good idea and sets you up for success. Finding information specific to scleroderma on the internet can be a challenge, so I hope you found this helpful. There is another wonderful resource I would invite y'all to look into, and that is Mobile's Mobcast, a scleroderma chat. It's a podcast hosted by scleroderma warrior Anne Mobilevsky, where she does deep dives with those affected by scleroderma, as well as specialists who care for scleroderma. I was honored to be on the podcast, which should come out soon, I think, so I hope you check it out. If you want to learn more about how scleroderma can impact your throat, I recommend checking out this video next. You'll learn more about the anatomy, what's happening, and some of the symptoms to look out for. My aim is to provide you with the autoimmune information you need to make the best health decisions for you. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.